Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. India calls out Pakistan and China at United Nations Security Council. Jammu and Kashmir police foils bid to target religious places by Kasnavi Force terror outfit. And ahead of FATF meeting, Pakistan court issues arrest warrant against Jesh Mohammed Chief Masood Azhar. India remains a victim of Pakistan's sponsored terrorism for decades. At various domestic and international platforms, New Delhi has raised the issue of terrorism, noting that it is high time countries from across the world should launch a collective mechanism to fight against this menace. In a recently held virtual debate on international cooperation in combating terrorism, India's External Affairs Minister Dr. S. J. Shankar slammed Pakistan and China for supporting and aiding terror activities. This was the first time that India made an intervention in the UNSC after it assumed temporary membership of the body on January 1, 2021. India raised the issue of state-backed terrorism during an open debate on international cooperation in combating terrorism 20 years after the adoption of 1373, an anti-terror resolution which was passed after the 9-11 attacks in the United States. Taking an indirect jibe at Pakistan, India's External Affairs Minister, Dr. S. J. Shankar, slammed the country for being clearly guilty of aiding and supporting terrorism and willfully provide financial assistance and safe heavens to terror leaders. Underworld Dawn and proscribed terrorist Dawood Ibrahim is one such terror leader with a huge terror empire whose illicit ventures are spread across the world under the banner of D Company with Islamabad support. India highlighted how the 1993 Mumbai bomb blast accused Dawood Ibrahim is not just given state protection but also enjoying VIP hospitality in Pakistan. Linkages between terrorism and transnational organized crime must be fully recognized and addressed vigorously. We, in India, have seen the crime syndicate responsible for the 1993 Mumbai bomb blast, not just given state protection, but actually enjoying five-star hospitality. As is widely known, China has always defended Pakistan on the issue of terrorism and has misused its power at UNSC to place a number of blocks and holes in the process of enlisting and delisting terror individuals. India suffered several roadblocks by China while getting the Jaish e Mohammed chief Masood Azhar on the UNSC's 1267 sanction list in May 2019. Perhaps still smarting under his designation, China even tried to block India's leadership at the important terrorism-related committees at UNSC, including Counter-Terrorism Committee, Taliban and Libya Sanction Committees. Urging UN Security Council members not to make false distinctions of good terrorists and bad terrorists, Jay Shankar came down heavily on both China and Pakistan for delaying the process of designating terrorist individuals and entities as well as failing to stop the funding of terror. We must reform the working methods of the committees dealing with sanctions and counter-terrorism. Transparency, accountability and effectiveness are the need of the day. The practice of placing blocks and holds on listing requests without any rhyme or reason must end. This only erodes our collective credibility. For several years, India has been itself battling terrorism with great determination. Talking about those challenges, India proposed an eight-point action plan for the United Nations in order to credibly address this menace of terrorism and ensure effective action. 
Indian External Affairs Minister also highlighted the fact that how COVID-19 pandemic has aggravated the situation of radicalization and recruitment by extremists and said it is time for the world to commit to zero tolerance policy for terrorism. While well, India has been itself battling terrorism for many decades with great resolve, these proposals have been framed with the interests of the entire international community in mind. It is time that all nations walk the talk against terrorism and commit themselves to the goal of zero tolerance. India has taken up the issue of the threat of global Islamic terrorism propagated by Islamabad at various world forums. Even as progress has been made in the last two decades, Pakistan-backed terrorism continues to pose a direct threat to international peace and security, requiring collective action at the global level. This time, global terror financing watchdog FATF has warned Pakistan to do more to rein in terrorist groups operating from its soil or face the consequences. If Pakistan fails to comply with FATF this time, it will face a much more aggressive and friendless international community where it is possible that even allies like China will no longer be able to help to bail out Pakistan in the future. Pakistan spy agency ISI formed Ghasnavi force to carry out terror attacks in India's Jammu and Kashmir. The newly formed terror outfit was recently trying to carry out attacks at the religious places with an attempt to disrupt communal harmony in the Union territory. The modus operandi was uncovered by the police with the arrest of members of Kasnavi Force, a report. Four terrorists associated with Ghaznavi Force terror outfit were planning to carry out attacks on religious places in Punch district of Jammu and Kashmir. Their arrest came a day after an IED planted on the Mendhar Goliad Road was foiled by the security forces. In December last year, police had arrested three Pakistan-linked terrorists and recovered six grenades from them, foiling a terror plot to attack a temple in the border district of Punch and disturb communal harmony. The Ghaznavi force has come out in front as an active terror outfit in attempting to perform such tasks. Created by Pakistan spy agency, the ISI, to carry out Pulwama-style terror attacks in India, this outfit includes assailants from lashkar e taiba Hezbul Mujahideen and Ansar Ghazwatul Hind. In Punch, where there is a mixed population, their aim is basically to attack certain religious houses, religious uh, buildings, so as to create communal tension. Now the thing is, if they succeed, even partially, then it can be a problem. Uh, because it will not just be a terrorist problem, because they will try their best to stoke communal feelings as well. And therefore, I think our security forces need to be on the guard. Already they are being neutralized. So our security forces are on the ground. They are being neutralized. But the thing is, this is a new development which you have to watch out for. The arrest of members of Ghaznavi force reveals that they were in regular touch with their handlers in Pakistan to disrupt normalcy and peace in Jammu and Kashmir. After the abrogation of Article 370 in August 2019, Pakistani proxies in Jammu and Kashmir are facing the existential crisis and this is why Pakistan is now attempting to create rift between the religious communities. A report by the Ministry of Home Affairs reveals that the ecosystem of Islamist radicalization, separatism and terrorism carefully created with lies, deceit and violence appears to be collapsing like dominoes in Jammu and Kashmir. As per the report, number of terrorism-related incidents in 2020 decreased by 63.93% as compared to the corresponding period in 2019. It says that there was also a decrease in fatalities of Special Forces personnel by 29.11% and a decrease in casualties of civilians by 14.28% in 2020. Terrorism-related incidents in the UT also reduced by around 36% in 2020. 
Pakistan, which now runs out of options to create instability in Kashmir, is concentrating enough to use narcotics as a major financing tool in the region, apart from attempting to disrupt communal harmony. There are attempts to ensure that narco-terrorism becomes a major force. Uh, two things. One is it's self-sustaining financially. Secondly, uh, in keeping with Pakistan, what Pakistan has done in surrounding countries, you introduce an element which creates disquiet. It basically breaks down the social fabric of the population where they are active. They've done it in Afghanistan. They're trying to do it in Jammu and Kashmir as well. As of now, I don't think it's very, very major. But unless we watch out and unless we are careful, it can be something major. But what encourages me is the speed at which all these new recruits are being neutralized. Pakistan's baseless claim over Kashmir has been an unfulfilled dream and it has also failed in creating an anti-India rhetoric among the youth of Jammu and Kashmir. Therefore, the kind of war it is planning for the future is fraught with dangers. Pakistan has been for years sponsoring and aiding terror organizations on its soil, but has now been forced to kneel down in front of the international community. Under immense pressure from FATF, Pakistan is trying to hoodwink the world by taking bogus action against terror leaders residing in the country. The latest one to join the list is Jashim Mohammed's chief, Maulana Masood Azhar. Recently, an anti-terrorism court has issued the arrest warrant against the UN-designated terrorist on the charges of terror financing. The court directed that Azhar be arrested and produced in the court by January 18th, a report. 14 February 2019, Pulwama terrorist attack. 40 Indian CRPF personnel killed. jesh -e Mohammed claimed responsibility. These heart-wrenching visuals speak of the supreme sacrifice of Indian security forces who have been fighting against Pakistan's misdeeds in Kashmir since time immemorial. Adil Ahmad Dar, a member of jesh -e Mohammed, blew himself up along with explosives laden vehicle into the moving convoy of the Indian Central Reserve Police Force, CRPF. Almost after two years of this gruesome incident, the perpetrator of this attack and chief of proscribed jesh -e Mohammed, Maulana Masood Azhar, is finally a wanted man in Pakistan. The anti-terrorism court Gujranwala issued an arrest warrant against this global terrorist on the charges of terror financing, who was claimed by Islamabad to have disappeared. I have no doubt that this action by Pakistan is a clever ploy to confuse FATF and or try to convince FATF that Pakistan is serious in taking action against terrorists. This is just a, just a clever ploy because in uh, February, FATF is going to review Pakistan's uh, status of being in grey list. And so therefore, Pakistan wants to show that it is in proactive mode and it is taking ag legal action against these terrorists. This, this has been the uh, trick of Pakistan for many, many years. Azhar is a fugitive released by India in exchange for passengers of a hijacked Indian airline in 1999. After his release, he founded jesh e Mohammed with the support of Pakistan's inter-services intelligence and scripted many terror attacks on India, including 2001 attack on Jammu and Kashmir Legislative Assembly, 2001 Indian Parliament attack, 2016 Pathan Court Air Base Attack, 2016 Attack on Indian Mission in Mazari Sharif, Afghanistan, 2016 Uri Attack, as well as the 2019 Pulwama Attack. Following the immense international pressure after the Pulwama attack, Pakistan government had to launch a crackdown on terrorism financing and arrest six militants of the Jesh in Gujranwala. 
over 100 terrorists belonging to Jaish e Mohammed were also arrested, including Masood Azhar's son and brother. However, till now, Pakistan continued to shield Masood Azhar despite being provided several dossiers by India, with specific details of his complicity in the Pulwama terror attack and the presence of Jaish terror camps and its leadership in Pakistan. Pakistan told the global anti-terror financing watchdog Financial Action Task Force that it hadn't been able to take action against Masood Azhar because he was missing. However, Pakistan's duplicity was exposed in a media interview when its foreign minister, Shah Mahmood Qureshi, denied Azhar's role in the attack and admitted that they are in contact with Masood Azhar. The mere fact that Pakistan has issued arrest warrant against Masood Azhar, it is testimony to the fact that Pakistan has directly or indirectly admitted that Masood Azhar is in Pakistan soil. We remember that in past, uh, Pakistan foreign minister had mentioned that they are in contact, contact, constant touch with Masood Azhar. What do you mean by being in constant touch? If he is a terrorist, you arrest him. What is the question of being in constant touch? So this, all this drama, all this gimmickry, all this playing with words is a clever, clever trick on the, on the part of Pakistan. This move by Pakistan is nothing but Islamabad's desperation to get off the FATF's grey list as it comes just ahead of meetings of the Global Watchdog in January and February, which will consider Pakistan's greater status. Observers say it has become a routine for Islamabad to come up with farcical actions prior to key international meetings. Similar moves were recently taken with the arrest of Zakir Rahman Lakhvi and Hafiz Saeed, who plotted and supervised the 2611 Mumbai terror attack. However, neither of the two of Pakistan's most famous faces of terrorism faces charges for killing scores of people, but just for terror financing. And now, arrest warrant against Masood Azhar narrates the same story. But the big question is, that will Masood Azhar face the real punishment or, like early occasions, be free to continue enjoying Pakistan's hospitality while in prison? Let's now talk about Pakistan's Balochistan province, which remains volatile because of incessant violence, bloodshed and violations of human rights. It is not only the civilians, but the Pakistani security forces in Balochistan have also suffered casualties with rising rift and ongoing nationalist movement. We take a look. Balochistan is Pakistan's largest but least populated province, which has been witnessing mayhem for the past several decades. Frequent blasts, encounters and kidnappings make it a volatile region. On January 10, an explosion at Turbat Cinema Bazaar injured four people. The attack was believed to be carried out by Baloch nationalists seeking to target Frontier Corps check post. Such attacks are frequent in Balochistan as the Baloch have continued to wage an armed struggle against Pakistan's forceful occupation. Pakistani authorities are doing all they can to destroy the culture, language, identity and uh, social fabric of Baloch society to quell the Baloch national struggle. The increasing state violence and sponsorship of uh, militant Islam in Balochistan are all ramifications of that agenda. Balochistan is in turmoil because the Baloch people are determined not to accept the curse of colonialism in a 21st century world. And Pakistan is determined, to, is determined to crush the Baloch national aspirations with the use of crude military prowess. Worsening violence in Balochistan is going largely unnoticed as Pakistan slides ever deeper into crisis. The province has become the epicenter of regional warfare. 
According to media reports, at least 3,184 people were killed in 2,886 attacks in Balochistan in the last decade. From 2010 to 2015, at least 2,049 people were killed in 1,707 attacks in Balochistan. The number of people killed in the province from 2016 to 2020 stood at 1,135. Overall, Balochistan witnessed 1,185 deadly attacks during this period, which killed 1,126 Pakistani security personnel. Many of these attacks were launched by oppressed Baloch people who were left with no other option. These people are taking up arms to save whatever is left in the land of the disappeared. But instead of redressing Baloch political and economic grievances, the Pakistani military is determined to impose state control through force. Baloch nationalists maintain that their actions are fueled by the military's attempts to subdue dissent by use of force. Even Pakistan's own experts believe that it's the state's repressive response that triggers radicalization of most elements of the nationalist movement in the province. The contemporary armed and political resistance in Balochistan is different from the earlier ones in many ways. Firstly, the Pakistani brutalities surpassed all their previous actions in Balochistan. Many of their actions tantamount to genocide according to the UN definition of genocide. Secondly, because of state brutalities, every family and every region in Balochistan has been affected. Thirdly, because of the increased fear among the Baloch that their language and cultural traditions are in mortal danger because of state-sponsored Islamization programs and the imposition of Urdu as their national language. Fourthly, resistance is gaining ground because of the active participation of a newly educated class among the Baloch. According to many Baloch nationalists, the argument that the Pakistan state is promoting terrorism, sponsoring terrorists, or using terrorism as a blackmailing weapon is now meaningless as it has become an integral part of the existence of the state. Surviving the savagery and barbarism unleashed by the state-backed forces isn't the only major task for the people of Balochistan though. They stare at a bleak future, looking on helplessly as the Chinese take control of their mineral-rich land under the pretext of China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, fortifying and fencing areas like the port city of Gwadar. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at nin.com. This is Shreya Savijay signing off on the behalf of entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.